sort of leaning on the example of uh, real life conversations because it, it makes the topic a little bit relatable. But it turns out that this can happen to computers too. So cryptographic binding is probably the most essential technique for ensuring that things that, I mean, if we could cryptographically bind things that we say, you know, in our real lives, that would be useful as well. Although I don't know how we would do that. Maybe that's an open research problem. But in regards to network protocols, the idea of cryptographic binding loosely defined as associating two or more related elements of information by using cryptography, right? Why would you want to do this? Well, it helps you resist a slew of bad things, most notably protocol interaction attacks. Um, protocol interaction attacks are very cool. It's this idea that you can use data from a protocol P to attack protocol Q, right? So I take a message from P out of context, twist it, and apply it to protocol Q. Same idea as what the reporters are doing to Professor Sherman, right? Uh, any questions about cryptographic binding? Because this is going to come up a lot, this word. All right, sounds so, good. So P could also be Q. Right. So I'll get into that example in a moment. So how do we cryptographically bind? There's actually a lot of ways to do this, but I'm going to focus on the most simple method that we also are going to see in two protocols in the slide deck, right? So the most easy way to cryptographically bind two things together is to use encryption. And the idea is going to be as follows, right? So let K be some secret key. And let me give you two different examples now. So in the first example, I send two separate messages. Hello encrypted with K, and then Alice encrypted with K. And in this example, hello and Alice aren't bound, even though both might be confidential if K is secret, uh, because they're not actually concatenated before, before we encrypt them. So we can bind these values together by actually concatenating them or including them in the same plain text that we then encrypt. And the idea is we're binding them together through this encryption, right? For somebody to decouple these phrases, essentially, they need to know the secret key. And that's quite useful. Um, this, te this technique appears in many, many protocols and has been part of the, sort of the protocol folklore for at least 40 years. Um, and it seems quite obvious, right, to do something like this potentially, but we'll actually discover that it's not so obvious. And we're gonna look at an example to show you just how subtle this sort of binding issue can be. And for those of you who do a lot of protocol analysis, you're probably bored to tears of this example, but it's going to be Needham Schroeder once again, but we're going to look at it from a slightly different lens. So I promise that it'll be different than usual. Binding is important because it prevents structural vulnerabilities. Structural vulnerabilities are generally the reason a protocol can interact with other protocols. And if a protocol is able to interact with itself in this manner, we actually call that a man in the middle attack in the context of sort of structural protocol exploitation, right? So we don't want that. It's actually really bad if protocols can do this. And many protocols, by the way, can, right? Protocol interaction actually is a fairly understudied topic. And we don't have any idea how protocols can interact with pro other protocols, right? Like often we don't even consider the case where protocol A interacts with some random other protocol B, right? Because this, this set of other protocols is uh, quite effectively infinite for the purposes of our studying. But we don't need to worry about this if we do binding correctly, I would argue. And let's look at the example of Needham Schroeder. So this is a mutual authentication protocol where two parties want to verify the identities over an insecure network. This goes back to 1978 when we were first trying to start dealing with the internet and the hostile entity it was becoming. And it's gotten much worse since then, as you can imagine now with most of the world connected and more devices than people communicating over this thing. Um, the way this protocol works is we're going to use a bit of encryption. So this is an encryption function. And Alice is going to initiate the protocol with Bob by generating what's called a nonce. So nonces are really important in cryptography. They're ra basically random numbers, but we generate them freshly for that context. So I'm going to use the word context a lot, right? Despite the fact that this is a protocol that appears to have the same messages each time, there's a specific context here. And even if Alice and Bob talk 100 times, this should be a hundred different nonces. So the nonces are a crucial part of the context of this protocol, and that's important. So Alice generates a nonce, right? Fresh cryptographically random number generated by Alice right here, and includes her identity and sends it to Bob. What does including Alice's identity do here? Well, this is a type of cryptographic binding, right? We have an encryption here of a nonce, which doesn't tell us anything, but also Alice's name. 
So by encrypting it with Bob's public key, we actually bind it together in such a way that really only Bob um, could potentially decouple these, right? And even so, Bob would need to know Bob's private key. So this is public key crypto, right? If you have a public key, you need to have the corresponding private key to decrypt that phrase. So what happens next? Well, Bob is going to re reply to Alice and we're following the original 1978 protocol, right? So Bob takes Alice's nonce, extracts it from that message, right? The context, appends to the context with a new nonce, Bob's nonce, encrypts it for Alice using Alice's public key. And uh, if you're paying close attention, you might already notice an issue here, but it's another nonce, right? And then Alice's response to this challenge, essentially Bob is challenging Alice. Do you have Alice's private key? Bob is saying to Alice and Alice can say yes by extracting the part of Bob's portion of the context, right? And sending it back to Bob using Bob's public key. So there's an issue here, which is well known. I don't want to belabor it too much, but the protocol begins with cryptographic binding. It actually binds you know, Alice to nonce Alice, but this is, this wasn't included back then for the purpose of cryptographic binding. This is actually included so that Bob knows who's contacting Bob makes sense. But the problem with this response is that we failed to bind in it. So my question is, is Bob's nonce actually bound to anything in this message at all? doesn't seem like it, right? So if Alice receives this message, it, per, it contains Alice's portion of the context, which Alice already knows, and then a foreign context that Alice knows nothing about. And unfortunately, there's not enough information for Alice to know who this came from, right? Because there is actually no other information in this message besides this strange nonce that is new. So the issue with that is you have this famous man in the middle attack that Lo found in 1995, which by the way, this is a protocol interaction. Why? Well, it's a man in the middle attack because the Needham Schroeder protocol is interacting with itself. So you have an instance here and an instance here. These are two separate instances of the Needham Schroeder protocol. But the issue is Eve, who is a hostile intruder in the middle, is going to use part of the contextual information from her instance with Bob in her instance with Alice. And that piece of contextual information is going to be NB. And the reason we can do this is NB is not bound to any context. So this is really the problem, right? There's no cryptographic binding for MB. So we can transpose MB from this, from this instance to that instance. And the end result here, if we do this, is Eve can successfully authenticate as Alice to Bob, right? Because Eve can steal contextual information from Alice's initial message. Note that Alice is actually reaching out to Eve to authenticate here. So this is one of the setups in what we call the Dolofiao intruder model. I'm not going to get into that too much today, but the idea is you might on the internet talk to somebody who means you ill. This can happen at any point in the modern internet, really. And we try to combat this with, you know, certificate authorities and all this other stuff, but sometimes things go wrong. So Alice talks to Eve, but Eve is going to manipulate Alice's message in a separate protocol instance of the Needham Schroeder protocol copy the context and then take advantage of the fact that MB is not contextually bound to authenticate as Alice to Bob. So that's real bad, right? On the internet, if somebody can do this. Um, I can't give you a concrete example of anybody ever using this exploit, but note that this is a common thread. You're gonna see this again in this presentation. So the solution to this problem is actually to cryptographically bind MB to Bob. And a very simple way to do this that Lowe actually proposed in 1995 is just throw Bob's name into this message, right? As discussed before, if we add pieces of information into you know, a phrase and we encrypt that entire phrase together, we're cryptographically binding those things together. So this at the very least binds NA and MB to the context of Bob responding, right? So Bob is now part of the context and that actually eliminates the attack we just saw. There's a strong argument that if you're making protocols for the real world, you could be adding a lot more to these messages than just that. For example, what if these two parties are using different versions of the protocol? Or what if these are from different sessions, right? Maybe this is Bob's context from another run of the protocol. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to cryptographically bind. Some of them don't even really have that much to do with security. They can be quite practical, right? And if you were to try and program this protocol, you'd probably end up having to do some of that. So what about the FIDO protocol? I might be going too fast, actually. Let me check the time real quick. I can slow down a little bit. I don't need to speak this quickly. I apologize. So FIDO protocol. This is a relatively new protocol. So 
probably early 2010s, they kind of got started with it and started publishing, you know, the specifications and stuff. It's known as the fast identity online protocol. And the goal of this thing is actually to become sort of a end all be all authentication protocol that supports, you know, multiple authenticators. Authenticators can actually be a whole slew of things, right? They can be USB security tokens or where you hit a button, right? to authenticate, or they can be trusted platform modules in your processor. They can be biometric scanners, you know, attached to devices, fingerprints, iris scans. Um, smartphones can integrate all kinds of authenticators and can also be authenticators themselves. So th the idea is it's an abstract concept, what an authenticator is, and you can come up with whatever you want here. And if you follow the protocol, it'll be fine. So the idea is you link one or more of these together into an authentication process, which is part of the universal authentication framework. You can read a lot about that at the FIDO Alliance website. The goal of this thing is to replace really passwords on some level. Right now we use passwords for a lot of things. Passwords are kind of rough. Human beings have a hard time with them. We have a very hard time remembering passwords, which is why we write them down on sticky notes or in text files or wherever. And we, stick them all over the place. You know, you can break into a lot of machines by just looking under the keyboard for a sticky note with a password on it, right? So human beings have a hard time remembering passwords. And the even worse thing is computers are pretty good at guessing them because human beings are predictable in how they choose passwords or they choose passwords that are, you know, possible for a computer to brute force. So we don't actually like passwords that much. And I'm sure some of you are using solutions or passwords like, you know, one pass and these sort of password vaults. And that's like a fairly decent solution. Um, and you could use something like FIDO to secure that, for example. Now, I'm not going to show FIDO. I think it's a cool idea, but it's not perfect, as we'll see. So the basic way this works, and if you've ever used Duo or any other multi-factor authentication software, you've probably followed this pattern before, right? The idea is you're over here with your user device, your desktop computer, what have you, and you're going to use some app or browser to access some resource, usually a web app, website, banking site, whatever. And the idea is you initiate the authentication, the web app, when it receives it, forwards that to a FIDO server. The FIDO server knows a little bit about you. Notably, it knows potentially what kind of authenticators you have. So you've bound authenticators you know, to the service. And it's going to basically issue a challenge to you. And it's going to say, you, might, you can answer with these authenticators. I'll accept these, you know. And the challenge that you receive, you send to your FIDO client, which is going to feed it to your authenticators. Each authenticator is going to sign the challenge. And then you're going to pass it back to the FIDO server. Fairly simple idea, challenge response, but you're involving these authenticators as kind of a third party. So this can be second factor, right? If you have your initial request and then maybe a password and your phone. But it's also n factors, right? You can have as many of these authenticators as you as you'd like. So the idea is to generalize this this dual factor authentication concept into into just a universal authentication framework. So does the FIDO protocol bind? Well, it uses cryptographic binding in various places, but the answer is maybe because it's actually optional, right, in the protocol. And the sort of justification in one of their blog posts is not all client platforms support, you know, the various cryptographic binding mechanisms that exist. So there's some standards, by the way, for doing cryptographic binding, including channel ID is an older one. And token binding is sort of the state of the art right now in terms of RFCs. And these all basically tie tokens, values, et cetera, to the underlying TLS channel. So it assumes you're using TLS, right? Which is not an unreasonable assumption on the internet. And, um, their concern is even if a client has a necessary support, you might not want to do it. So basically the FIDO position is to ensure we support as many different platforms and use cases as possible. We're not going to make you use these channel, these cryptographic binding, channel binding primitives, right? Oh boy. Okay. So this is a bit analogous to making it optional for Needham Schroeder where that doesn't quite work right. So let's figure out what happens if we don't bind. And uh, in the background, I'm using something called a cryptographic protocol shapes analyzer to do this. For anybody interested in learning this tool, we actually teach it to people in our little protocol analysis lab. So absolutely reach out to us if you want to do this kind of work. But for now, let's analyze FIDO. So FIDO is a protocol with a fair number of messages, although part of this is just going to be something we've already seen. 
So we have three entities communicating here. We're going to keep it nice and simple, right? One authenticator, although this could be many, a single client, single server. And this is a simplified version of the FIDO authentication protocol. So if you're looking at the standard right now, then looking at my slides and calling file, yes, I'm abstracting a few things, but the core, the core is going to be here of the issue, right? So the clients actually, we're going to reuse a protocol we've already looked at on these slides. We're going to use Needham Schroeder Low, so the corrected version of Needham Schroeder, to establish a secure channel between the client and the server. And this is actually important that we do this, right? Normally, you'd use TLS to do this, but if I try to draw a protocol diagram with TLS, I either make it one line or you become very sad because it's a huge protocol. So the client's going to generate an ONCE for the client and denounce themselves. Can we... Um, using the server's public key, communicate with the server. Note, we're making a very generous assumption here that everyone knows everyone's public keys. In real life, this is a difficult problem, which is why we have certificates and certificate authorities. But let's just, for the sake of argument here, say that everyone knows everyone's public keys. So as we've sort of seen before, the server receives you know, the client's nonce, generates a server nonce, announces themselves as a server, also cryptographically binding this nonce to themselves, replies to the client. This part is important, right? If you if you omit this, we have the issue from earlier, which means that the server could authenticate as the client to somebody else. And then that's the fun, that's the funnest part. So remember that. So because sometimes one protocol breaking can cause another protocol to break even worse, which would be which would definitely be the case here if you were using just Needham Schroeder instead of Needham Schroeder low. And the client's going to respond to that challenge from the server with the server's nonce. And at this point, the client and the server have a fairly strong understanding or suspicion that they are who they claim they are. So at this point, we can actually enter the FIDO protocol, right? So this this box is medium, short, or low. We're just establishing a secure channel between these two entities. So now we get into the FIDO part of this. The server is going to generate some challenge. By the way, the challenge is probably, in most cases, just going to be some long random number generated from a cryptographically secure random number generator. And we're going to send that challenge to the client encrypted with a key that consists of... This is not the best way, by the way, to, to derive a key from medium shorter, but we're just going to do it here because it's simple. We're just going to take each of the nonces, right? Because the idea is unless you are either the client or the server, you don't have both nonces. So we're going to concatenate these nonces together to create a secret key that is shared by the server and the client. Seems reasonable, right? So the client receives this challenge, but the client can't do anything with this, right? We actually have to pass this off to an authenticator. And we're not going to give the challenge in its exact form to the authenticator. We're going to hash it. There's actually a reason we do it this way. And the hash of that challenge we're going to encrypt with a key that we share with our authenticator. So at some point we bound, uh, we sort of paired, you know, our device with an authenticator. So there's some key that exists between those two entities. Probably we had nothing to do with establishing that key, but it exists. So we sent the authenticator the hash of the challenge. And then the authenticator is going to produce a new value called a sign challenge, where essentially it's going to take that hash and sign it with its private key. What the authenticator now does is it replies with that sign challenge. And I realize I've made a mistake here because this should actually also then again be encrypted with the authenticator and the client key, right? There should be another layer of encryption out here. This is just the wrong key. This should be the key up here. So that's my mistake. And then what ends up happening as a result of this is the client has the sign challenge, which is signed with the authenticator's private key. What do we do with the signed value? We're going to send it back to the server. Right. So the server receives a sign challenge encrypted under this sort of shared key that we derived before. Cool. So that's FIDO. Are there any questions? Doesn't sound like it. Okay. So, question. Are we forgetting to bind something important here? And I actually want all of you to look at this protocol. Based on the example we saw before from Needham Schroeder, tell me if you think there's an important thing that we're not binding to a context in this example. Is the challenge bound? The challenge? 
is a vital part of the context here, right? In fact, the challenge is unique to this context because the server will freshly generate the challenge each time. But that observation, I think, rings fairly true in the sense that what is it bound to? It doesn't look like it's bound to anything, right? So when the client receives this challenge, it really has no idea who the challenge was generated for, what the challenge was generated for, who generated the challenge, right? So there's a lot of contextual stuff missing here. And that's a problem. Because it turns out that if you don't bind the challenge, you can receive the challenge from anyone. So there could be an adversary sitting over here. And the adversary might receive this challenge from a legitimate server, claiming to be you, hand it to you, right? You hand it to your authenticator, which signs it, and then you hand that signed challenge back to the adversary, who's now going to use it to authenticate his you to something. So that's a man in the middle attack. That's no good. And it pretty Let's much talk about question. What's so up? that encrypted challenge with the red text of the challenge, is that encrypted with the client's public key? No, this is encrypted with the result of doing uh, the New Hampshire or low here before. And this, right. would just be, this would just be encrypted with TLS in sort of a real deployment of FIDO, right? And it, it does contain a few things in, in, the, in the real protocol to be generous, but nothing that cryptographically binds it to anything. Also, the word challenge looks more and more misspelled the longer I look at it, which is weird. <laughs> Um, so this is no good, this scenario. And this is, in fact, a direct result of failing to bind. And there's a few ways you can bind this challenge, by the way. And the way that FIDO does it is it uses TLS token binding. So the idea is the challenge would include a portion that binds it to the actual TLS channel between the client and the server, in which case the client would realize that this is being forwarded, right? Because the adversary almost certainly doesn't have the server's public key. That is unless the server is malicious, which could happen. In that case, though, there's not much you could do, right? If you're trying to communicate with a server that wants to feed you a malicious resource, then that's going to happen, you know, even if you're using FIDO, like you authenticate yourself to a malicious entity, right? But as a, as a man in the middle situation goes, this does allow for one. And it's left open by FIDO whether or not you want to go down this route and um, sort of neglect this channel binding that would prevent this. And note, this is actually really the same problem, right? If we go all the way back, or maybe this is a bad idea. If we go all the way back to this example, where NB in Needham Shorter, and this is from 19, you know, this protocol, I remind you, is from 1978, right? So 1978, we make a protocol where we don't know better, where MB isn't bound to anything because we don't assume that Bob would ever be a malicious entity that will misuse this context for something else. So this is 1978. But then you go and you look at a protocol from 2000, you know, the standard, the latest version of the standards from 2017. And you have the same situation as a challenge that's not bound to the person sending it even, right? So my question to you all is, is this okay? Because we're really repeating past mistakes by allowing this, right? So there's a reason FIDO allows it. They justify it. They have, they are aware of the risk of allowing it but they find that it's more important to make sure that, that the protocol works across a broad spectrum of platforms and, and use cases rather than eliminating this, this sort of man in the middle attack that exists in any situation where you fail to bind like this, by the way. So in a sense, I feel like we're repeating past mistakes. I have a position on this, but I also wanna hear your positions on this. Um, man in the middle attacks, basically, I remind you are just really in the context of protocols, protocol interaction attacks, right? Where a protocol interacts with itself rather than with a different protocol continue to exist because we make mistakes like this. And also whenever you allow a cryptographic protocol to weaken itself optionally, that's going to happen on purpose eventually. Right? So I don't know if you're aware of like TLS downgrade attacks, but the idea is, you know, in, in the name of supporting lots of computers, TLS used to also offer weak crypto primitives, right? That you could choose initially when you decide what, what cryptography you're gonna use to do your TLS uh, hand exchange or handshake rather. And downgrade attacks exist on every single protocol that does this. So anytime you're like, okay, well, if you need to, for legacy support, you can downgrade this security to this lower level, an adversary will do that on purpose. 
So this is a downgrade attack against Fido is almost certainly possible because any adversary can claim, well, I can't do this channel binding thing, right? So that's a problem. So I'd like to discuss that. Is it okay? This is an open question to everyone here. Is it okay that protocols, even today, make it option make certain security features optional and allow you to basically forego things like channel binding in the example we just saw um one thing to consider is if you don't allow backwards compatibility for a business what incentive would you have to upgrade to that when you'd have to upgrade a whole lot more stuff than just the one thing it would cost a lot of money so it would be unlikely to actually be used at least in the short term i think it's that's the same valid, reason that's that's a super valid point i actually think that's responsible for a lot of security problems that exist you know yeah across, it's kind of like various... i think microsoft is forcing uh the use of uh, hardware encryption um i can't remember what they're called for windows 11 and a lot of people aren't going to be able to upgrade to Windows 11 because they don't have systems that support it. And they're doing that because it's kind of forcing people's hands to get these hardware encryption things if they want to get go to Windows 11. So in the next decade, trust TPMs. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if in the next five years when we have that time and you need to start needing to upgrade to windows 11 everyone's going to start doing that because they don't have another option so in the long term it would be good but in the short term it probably wouldn't be super successful i saw a question from uh russ here so the attacker can know and see an ns because the attacker negotiated that with the client basically the attacker pretended to be the server and then the attacker is communicating with the actual server on the other side. And then it does actually receive a challenge claiming to be, you know, the client feeds it to the real client, client feeds it to the authenticator, authenticator signs it, gives it back to the client who gives it to the adversary, who gives it to the server, right? So it's really the same attack in some sense as the one on Needham Schroeder. And there's a, there's a pattern to these. They tend to look the same attacks that exploit. It would be helpful that. to see the graphic of that, but thanks for, for answering the question. I tried to make one. It was too wide for the slide. <laughs> but I, I do have an example with, with CPSA, if you want to look at that, which I, which I think portrays it somewhat more clearly. But yeah, um, pretty much you end up having a malicious entity sitting between the client and the server. And that's where the man in the middle attack takes place. But that's a good question. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize. Okay, so on clear. one of the previous slides, when you show it, yeah, you've got those blue and gray bubbles. Uh, uh, go one more back. Okay, so, sorry, you know you're fine. They're right there. Um, okay, so the authenticator is on the far left, the client's in the middle, and the server's on the right. So yeah. the attack that happens is the first four bubbles on the top, starting from the top. Yeah. In your attack scenario, the client would actually be negotiating with the uh, attacker is that right client right? negotiates with the attacker okay then 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 what does the attacker do after the fourth bubble how, how do they now they, they pretend to be the client I'm, I'm so the the, so there's a communication path missing here if this if this server is malicious which it can be right when we're analyzing right. structural protocol security right. it can claim to be the client right potentially well, so this is this example would exist mainly if this was broken. Like if we removed the server here and we had the broken version of Needham Schroeder, then this would be quite easy, right? But the the classic example in dual factor authentication that we're concerned about is the server has compromised your like the the server has compromised the client's account, but can't can't log in with it because they don't have this authenticator, right? So the idea is they would initiate they would wait for the client to initiate a login, then initiate one of their own. And then feed the challenge to the to the client somehow, and there's various ways to do this. In this example, it's not. If, if this end-to-end -end encryption is is completely secure, right, then this is somewhat difficult to do. But conceivably, if the client is intentionally authenticating to a malicious server, 
the server might have already picked up a challenge from another one, right? That it wants to get the client to sign with their authenticator. And if this challenge doesn't have enough contextual information attached to it, the authenticator might unwittingly sign a challenge that is not really applicable to this situation, right? Of the client speaking with this particular server. And that's sort of what we're worried about. Um, and I, I do agree that a good graphic would, would help show that. Um, tell me, tell me what is key client authenticator. So this is a key that is sort of pair created when you pair an authenticator with a specific client, okay. right? And so it's a symmetric the, key between the two. I see. And somehow the attacker has that key. The attacker doesn't have that key. The, this is actually what the attacker needs is they need the client to sign their challenge with their authenticator, right? So they find a way to feed their challenge to this client who then signs it and gives it back. And then this, if the server is malicious, right? Rather in this example, you know, if we have the adversary here, they get the sign challenge back and then they can do anything they want with this, right? I mean, the sky is the limit and that's sort of the goal. Um, I think this is what I was trying to show on this slide is that really the only goal the adversary has here is to get this challenge signed by the client's authenticator. Because, you know, the authenticator has no idea what the context for this challenge is and thus just signs it essentially. And then there's a slew of things we can do with this. Most notably, we can present the sign challenge to another server elsewhere, potentially claiming to be the client, right? If we, for example, compromise the client's private key, um, the private key of the client isn't enough, you know, to get to get the authenticator to sign something. In fact, the authenticator doesn't even use the private key of the client. It really just has a shared key between the two. So you need the authenticator is the idea, right, in a protocol like this. Does that kind of answer the question? I'm sure it answers the question. I'm not sure I'm tuned in well enough at this point to understand the answer. So, you know, I, um, you know, at this point, it would be kind of interesting if you could whiteboard. All right. So now the adversary has a sign challenge. Like, you know, now what can they do? Uh, with that sign challenge, you know, it seems to me like the adversary is the one that comes up with a challenge in the first place. Now, the adversary could be getting that challenge from somewhere else. So maybe they've gone off and tried to start their own negotiation and somehow they've gotten some server to give them back a challenge. And now the trick is to continue imposing themselves as the client. That's exactly it. Yeah, I see. So this so they've is, stolen this your is the, private key. So they're claiming to be you to a server, but they need to get this signature, this challenge signed by ah, your authenticator. Yeah. So they have your private key. Yes. Okay. Um, that for example, well, right? Isn't that a trusted assumption? I mean, doesn't the whole thing break down? If, I mean, isn't the assumption here that the private key stays private? Well, the point of multi-factor authentication, right, is that there's multiple oh. factors. So if one of them gets compromised, the other ones are supposed to do something. But in this example, if you're private key gets compromised, your authenticators are also compromised because you don't have that contextual binding, right? Um, That's an interesting question. What what actually constitutes multi-factor? Because sometimes I've seen multi-factor on the key itself. So for example, um, you know, like RSA secure IDs or something, they, they used to make a version that had a touchpad right on the token. And yeah. so you, you, you know, the, the token number that's inside the RSA machine, and then you type in your PIN and it, you know, changes that token somehow. So it's multi-factor in a sense, but, but it's really a single, it's multi-factor on a single yeah. cryptographic entity. It'd be one authenticator, I think, in the UAF framework. I see. Um, this is multi-factor on, on two different cryptographic entities. One is the private key of the client and the other is whatever the authenticator has to say. Right. And the authenticators are like, when you have channel binding, the authenticators are aware of the context of that challenge more aware uh -huh. than when you don't because the challenge includes when you have channel binding the details of the channel so that means if the adversary is generating that challenge you would at least know that it's not originating from the request the client made does that make sense because the client would include some information in that challenge as well and then the authenticator could see wait this doesn't match so it has a way to detect that but without channel binding it's actually quite hard to detect right because there's not enough contextual information for the authenticator to know. Really, it's from the authenticator's perspective that we want this to work. The authenticator should not sign a challenge that is contextually inappropriate. Does that make sense? Yeah, because right now in the model you're showing, the, the authenticator is more or less like an oracle. Hey, here's a, yes. here's we a challenge. Like <laughs> sign it. 
and it doesn't it doesn't really care well the only way it cares is that there's this key between the client authenticator and we're saying that that key has somehow fallen into the yeah you know, it it's like your password right like if you're if somebody steals your password but you still have your cell phone right that the the website right. has to call right your bank sends you your pin by a text message that you have to enter you're like halfway compromised but the issue is if the adversary finds a way to get you to authenticate their request right with the authenticator then that's an issue like um i used to use yeah. duo so one of duo's features right was that when you try to log into whatever web page you're logging into you get a phone call on your cell phone you pick up the phone call just some automated message and you hit a number and you authenticate right your login attempt the problem with this phone call is it's kind of boring to listen to. And after a while, you don't listen to the details, which are like where and when, although that stuff can be spoofed anyway. And you just, you pick up the phone call and you hit a number and boom, you're done. In fact, a kid could accidentally pick up this phone call and do this, right? It's actually quite prone to accident even. So the issue is if I log into my account that's secured by Duo, right? And the adversary sees that. And they stall my login request, right? If they control the network I'm on, which, which, you know, the LFR model, they do. They stall my request, make their own, but then I get a phone call, right? But the phone call is not for my request. It's for theirs. But I don't know that because there's no contextual information. So I hit the number and now I've authenticated their request. So multi-factor, but not. So helpful. all they need to do is find a way to put DTMF tones into your outgoing voicemail message. Yeah. There's a ton of ways you can do this, right? But the idea is you trick my authenticator into authenticating your request as the adversary. And that's possible if there's not enough context attached. And almost every dual factor authentication uh, software we've seen has this problem. And in fact, Fido is the first one I've seen that tries to solve it, but it makes the solution optional, which is kind of disappointing, right? Oh, yeah. I think Google and other companies have figured this out recently as well because it has changed right it's not just a link that you click anymore like now it's like okay here's a specific pin and you have to enter that pin into the page that generated the request but again you don't know if it's yours right the request because like if i try to log into my google account and i need a verification code when i receive that the code i don't know if that code is well i would have to enter it right so the idea is if you don't have access to my email address and my email account you can't see the verification code to enter it for your request so it happens behind the scenes but that's a solution too but the idea is there has to be a context bound to that to that request right that's the big thing the challenge needs to be bound very specifically to the context in which it's being issued and if it isn't then you have then a lot of things can go wrong basically right. this is what we're sort of discussing here there's this question about FIDO and uh, distributed denial of service and denial of service. Um, I haven't really looked at FIDO's resistance to denial of service. It stands to reason that I think anything is vulnerable to a massive cluster of machines overwhelming it with traffic. I don't really see how you prevent that uh, outside of congestion control mechanisms and stuff like that. But in general, you're going to affect availability for people with anything. Um, it's possible. An interesting idea is... Um, if, if there are authenticators that are expensive to reuse, like let's say you have this authenticator where like, you know, you have to shake it for a minute. I don't know why you would design an authenticator like this. But like if there's an annoying one, you could, you could I guess, annoy a person by meticulously requesting the most difficult authenticators and then just constantly denying their authentication attempt. That's a sort of denial of service attack on a person that I don't know. I don't know how appropriate that would be in most situations. But these are excellent questions, and I think this is an interesting discussion. Um, does anybody else have any questions or input? So I'm a little bit confused as to how including the, the server's identity in the, the message, which is to be bound, actually prevents this kind of man in the middle attack because, because I assume like in the man in the middle attack, the adversary is receiving the server's identity. Uh, so why can't the adversary just forward that identity in the message, which was supposed to be bound? So you're correct. Actually, if we just try to solve this problem, the way we solved it, for the way Lowe solved it for Needham Schroeder, it won't work. So the binding needs to be stronger than that. An example is you can sign the challenge with the private key of the server that issued it. In which case the client or the authenticator could see, well, this isn't for the service, right? 
um, the way we the way they do it is with token binding, TLS token binding, where they're actually binding the uh, the challenge to the TLS channel, which which requested it, right? So the authenticator would be able to see, wait a minute, you know, this is not the context. Contextually, this is not the same communication session that the client thinks it is, right? Um, so you, you need to do more. Yeah, if you just throw in the name, I think the adversary can absolutely just replace that name. So there's a there's an RFC standard on TLS token binding. So if you're interested in seeing how they do that, I would I would look into that RFC. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Um, so Dr. Fatak, it turns out Google is involved in FIDO. Uh, so so, and, and they're probably doing it a little bit for money. So maybe this is already happening, right? Any other questions? I'm aware that it wasn't maybe not so clear at the end of the presentation there, sort of um, what was happening uh, with the challenge. Would so you I'll like to it. say a few words about um, your protocol workshops and also about your dissertation plans? Yeah, absolutely. So these past semesters, although although we haven't had one sort of recently, we had a protocol analysis workshops where we are teaching students how to use CPSA to analyze protocols just like FIDO or Needham Schroeder, and, and sometimes very different protocols to opaque protocols, things like secure remote password, et cetera. If you're interested in learning how to do that and you want to do protocol analysis research, like sort of what you see here, then absolutely reach out to us. We can get more of these workshops started and um, and start teaching you how to use tools because there's a bunch of different tools for doing this. It turns out it's pretty hard to do it with your with your head, right? Um, because binding can be tricky. But but please do reach out if you're interested. And as for my dissertation, so at this point I am somewhat on a crusade for cryptographic binding, right? Like a at the very least, when I look at protocols that don't do it, even like FIDO where it's optional, I think we're making a mistake. So I want to, so, so this is sort of the, the second chapter of the thesis, right, is where we're discussing the importance of cryptographic binding in the, in the grand context of designing protocols secure against the Dole of Yao adversary specifically, which is like the adversarial model in the tools we use. And that's an adversary that controls the entire network. So the entire network is hostile and you have to communicate over a hostile network. And it turns out good protocols are able to do this, right? Uh, and FIDO certainly does when you have TLS channel binding, but when you don't, it, it fails quite comprehensively at communicating over a network like this. So the idea is what if we create a way to easily insert contextual binding into any protocol? So sort of the next step here is to create a compiler that given some protocol will output a version of that protocol where every single message is bound to the context of not only the protocol, but the instance of the protocol that the message is supposed to be part of. And if, if you find a solid, like one of the challenges is to find a solid, reliable way to do this. But if you do this, it actually really makes protocol interaction attacks quite difficult. Um, I don't want to say impossible because I don't have a proof, right, for that. But but it seems like it would be quite challenging because a lot of structural attacks on protocols, and when I say a lot, I mean every single one I've seen, relies on using protocol data out of context across protocol instances or across protocols. So this is sort of the plan right now. Does that is that is that sort of enough detail, Professor Sherman? Or do you need more? Um, thanks. That that's good. It's the crusade for cryptographic binding in cyber. I like that. Um, certainly, it's something all of you should think about if you're designing protocols. Um, even if even if it's just for finding bugs, because I don't know if you've ever seen what happens if two people communicate using different versions of a protocol and the protocol doesn't realize that it is a version mismatch, but it can go south really quickly. Um, but certainly from the perspective of securing against a structural attacker like a Dole of Yao attacker that is looking for protocol interactions, um, you have to cryptographically bind to your context specifically. It would also be useful if we could cryptographically bind the things we say and do to a context, right? Like you could, for instance, record this entire talk, find me saying something silly, present it out of context somewhere, and it could be embarrassing or harmful to my reputation or whatever, right? So it'd be nice if I could bind everything I'm saying here to this talk in some way. 
but it's a bit difficult to do with people, but we can do it with computers, so we should. Uh, any other observations, comments? Does anybody think, I guess um, Richard made a decent case for, for sort of issuing security in favor of compatibility, adoption, et cetera. Um, certainly in cases where business concerns override security concerns, which feels tragically often, right? Well, I, abject silence and empty chat. Do you, do you know of other um, interesting examples of modern protocols where uh, crucial security elements are optional? Other examples? Um, well, there is an example from PAL, right? We analyzed the secure remote password protocol, maybe not so modern, but we found this malicious server attack, which basically relies on a server not realizing that a malicious process copy of it is talking to it, right? Which again, the reason this happens is there's not enough context for it to realize this. So if you attach context binding to those messages, then that becomes a good bit harder. Um, I suspect it exists, you know, I don't know the protocol details for many of these multi-factor authentication protocols that exist now, but I imagine many of them have this problem. Um, there are examples in literature of other protocols that have this issue. Uh, recently, we ran into a sort of um, proxy binding protocol, which I think um, Kirillus is analyzing. I don't know if Kirillus is here today, which I think has this problem, you know? So, I, it, it, I mean, pick a protocol, really, right? I think most protocols don't do adequate context binding, probably. I, I wasn't asking about context binding. I asked about um, optional policies. Optional. Oh, God, yes. So TLS, right? Like which we are all using right now. You connect it to this WebEx call via HTTPS. Uh, TLS is probably the most prolific offender, right? Because it allows you to choose from cipher, you know, primitives from these cipher suites, right? And like oftentimes there'll be broken stuff in there that hasn't gotten deprecated or pulled out yet. And yeah, it's like anything. Once you start deploying a piece of software and you run into legacy software where it can't do certain things, you just immediately start offering these downgrades and, and TLS is a huge offender. In fact, TLS is probably the most noteworthy example of downgrade attacks, but I imagine they exist against other protocols as well. But TLS is sort of the one I harp on because we all use it. We're all using it right now. Every word I say is coming through TLS to you. Analysis of Pico. Uh, we have not done an analysis of Pico. But it'd be interesting to see if the Pico tokens are correctly bound to the context they're being used in. This is always the question now, right? For me, at least, is when I see a protocol, is like, here's this piece of information. Is this correctly bound to a context? If not, then... And, and bear in mind, we're probably missing does we're probably missing an infinite quantity of attacks because when most people analyze protocols, they only consider the case of protocol Q interacting with protocol Q, right? It's actually quite rare that we analyze protocol Q interacting with protocol P. And it turns out that a tool like CPSA is actually very good at doing this. It, its main purpose seems to be, at least to me, to find protocol interactions. So th this is like a huge open research area. If anybody wants to roll up their sleeves, is to just start looking if, because a protocol might be secure when interacting with itself, but is it secure when interacting with another protocol? And that answer is sort of up in the air. And if there's inadequate context binding, there's probably some protocol that exists and they actually generalize this as a chosen protocol attack. Like if you don't bind to a context adequately, there probably exists an adversary that can create a protocol that interacts badly with yours for example, right? So this binding is once again, crucial. I'll keep harping on that for the rest of my life, probably. I, I think Pico would be a good protocol for us to analyze. It's within the space of authentication protocols. It's my <laughs> favorite, favorite authentication strategy. Um, and I think we have the capability to do it. Okay. Yeah. Any authentication protocol is interesting, right? Because those are the ones where context binding, especially if you have like, a device, right, that is receiving a challenge and signing it. That challenge has to have enough context for the device to say, wait a minute, I don't want to sign this. And usually there's not enough context. 
All right. Well, I thank you so much for being an attentive audience. I'm sorry if the the last few slides were a little bit confusing. I'll work on a better graphic. It it, it seemed clear to me at the time, but in hindsight, you never know how something is thank going to go over. Thank you for uh, a nice talk and a very promising dissertation. We'll be back in uh, two weeks with Josiah Dykstra. Bye.